What we have here, gentlemen, is a murderer who kills his victim, removes both his rings, carefully puts one of them back, leaves his calling card, and then vanishes into thin air. And does it all inside the space of 30 seconds. Now, tell me, Mr. Holmes, what manner of man can do that? What manner of man, indeed? Oh, that's fine. <laughs> that's very fine. <laughs> The Valley of Fear by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle with Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr. John Watson, Ian Glenn as John McMurdo and Ronald Pickup as the narrator. Episode 2, The Tragedy of Burlston. John! John! Eddie! John, is it true? Tell me it's not true. Easy now, calm down. What's your honor about? The Wilcox family. All murdered. Murdered? Sure, it was an accident. The man kept blasting powder in his house. Look at me, John. No, that'll be a pleasure. Stop it. Stop this stupid act. I hate it. You'll have to trust me, Akushla. Trust you? How can I trust you? For all I know, you may have killed those people yourself. Will you keep your voice down? Three little children, John. Eddie. Don't touch me. I never want to see you again. Darling. Go to your scour of friends. Hooray! Here's to a job well done. Brother McMurdo! Spring had come to Pennsylvania with running brooks and blossoming trees. New hope for all nature bound so long in the iron grip of winter. But nowhere was there any hope for the men and women of the Vermissa coal fields. Darkly, the shadow of death lay on the valley of fear. <coughs> Watson, I don't think I can add anything to the local doctor's report. Both barrels full in the face. Death would have been immediate, thank God. What about the mark on his arm? Yes, you were right. This man's been branded like an animal. Impossible to tell how old the mark is, I'm afraid. Did he make any attempt to conceal it, Inspector? Why, it's not mentioned in the report, White Mason? Not particularly. At least, not according to Mr. Barker. Mr. Barker, yes. Yeah. Is there anything else, Doctor? No, not really. He seems to have been in good physical shape. Had he been depressed at all, nervous? I didn't ask. Depressed, Doctor? You're still thinking of suicide? Uh, we have to consider all the possibilities. It's unlikely, I grant you. I've never heard of a suicide like it. All those preparations must have been damnably cold-blooded. It's not entirely unheard of. No, I can't accept it. He was killed by a stranger who entered the house after dark. An American. Man, you're traveling too fast. That's an American gun. Sawn off in the American manner. That's not what I mean. I've heard no evidence that there was a stranger here at all. <laughs> the open window, blood on the sill, the queer visiting car. The muddy boot mark behind the curtain. Yeah. Hmm? I didn't see that. It's very faint, but quite definite. Well, reinforces my theory. I'm obliged to you, Mr. Holmes. There's nothing there that couldn't have been arranged by someone inside the house. Mr. Douglas was an American. Mr. Barker lived in America. You don't need to import someone from outside to account for American doings. Excuse me, Inspector. What is it, lad? We've found something, sir. Outside. Oh, 
a rudge what what well, it's common enough bicycle it's well ridden it's been used for a considerable journey very recently the uh, the mud streaks and splashes were all made within a few hours of each other what's the nearest large town Tonbridge Wells. I suppose there's no doubt that this is how the killer got here. Oh, it's too near the house to have been dumped casually. But what in the name of all that's wonderful made him leave it behind? What sort of murderer makes off with a wedding ring but abandons his quickest means of escape? We don't seem to get a gleam of light in this case. Don't we? <laughs> Very lonely now, Mary, for the poor make no new friends. But oh, they love the better still, the few our father sends. And you were all I had, Mary, my blessing and my pride. There's nothing else to care for now. Since my poor Mary died I'm bidding you a long farewell My Mary kind and true But I'll not forget you, darling In the land I'm going to They say there's bread and work for all and the sun shines always there But I'll not forget old Ireland Were it fifty times as fair Were it fifty times as fair By God, McMurdo, you've a voice on you to charm the devil himself here, take a drink of that. For my thanks to your counsel. Give us another one, brother. Ah, right. Will you let the man finish his drink? <laughs> Murdo, Brother Scanlon, let me fill your glass. No, listen, I, I've got to talk to you. Come outside. I hope this is worth taking me away from a drink for, brother. <laughs> oh, I've had a letter from back east. I left good friends behind when I came out here. Here, see for yourself. Why didn't you take this to the past? After the last time, it'd be all up with me. But you can do something about it. You've got to, or we're all dead men. Anything? Uh, nothing. It's a stone ledge. It wouldn't hold footmarks for long. Well, we're directly opposite the study. If he had crossed the moat, this is the obvious place to climb out. Yes. Is there the drawbridge raised every night? Six o'clock, without fail. And Mr. Douglas himself checked all the ground floor windows last thing. The man was afraid of something. Deathly afraid. And with good reason. Shall we set up the interviews now? Uh, if you would, Mr. Mack. Uh, do you want to do the questioning? Well, I'll be very happy to leave it to you. It's always a pleasure to learn from an expert. Indeed it is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the library or the dining room, I think. Watson and I will join you there. <clears throat> I, uh, I thought you'd finished in here. Hmm? Uh, not quite. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of it? Oh, I think we can discount suicide. Hmm. I know there have been cases. Yes, but so this isn't one of them. Kill yourself with a double barrel shotgun and the recoil throws the weapon away from the body. It certainly doesn't leave it neatly lying on the chest. I'll take your word for it. Yes. Well, what do you think of this? Hmm? Yeah. Mm, dumbbell. Douglas was a fit man. He liked to exercise. Why is it significant? Because I can only find one. Only one? But you have to use them in pairs. Douglas certainly did. Hmm. I'm quite sure. Yeah. There'd be unilateral development. Maybe even curvature of the spine. No. He definitely used two. Interesting. Is this how we do our business? Item five. 
I'm an unbody master. We missed your voice, mother. Take your place. I'm an unbody master. I claim urgency. We've better things to do than listen to you, McMurdo. Uh, A claim of urgency takes precedence, Brother Baldwin. Speak. There's a Pinkerton detective in the valley. What? He's their top man, Bertie Edwards. And he's collecting evidence that'll put a rope around all our necks. What? What's your proof, Brother McMurdo? This letter. I have friends in business back east, and they know what they're saying. Five big companies and two railroads have engaged Pinkerton to sweep the valley clean once and forever. Oh, I've heard of this Bertie Edwards. Me too. He's a crack man. And he's here already. Uh, he'll be under a different name. In Chicago, he went as one of those damned newspaper men. Steve Wilson. In Chicago? You know this man? Uh, I saw him once. I'd know him again. It always has to be you, doesn't it, McMurdo? You lay down the law. You get the best jobs. You save the whole damn lot. And your neck along with that Baldwin, much as I'd rather see it snap. Enough! Brother McMurdo, if you know how this man operates... What do you think he'll be doing? If he's using the same disguise, he'll be going around asking a lot of questions. Offering money for information on the scourers. Then if any brother is approached by a stranger, I want to hear about it straight away. Can we do any more than that, McBurdo? No, we can't. All we can do now is wait. No one present heard McMurdo's words without a shudder of fear. That night, the usual revelry of the lodge was short and subdued. I thought this room would be the best. That's very good. Um, we'll sit this side of the table, facing the door. Witnesses, one at a time, sitting opposite. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Holmes. Have you finished with the body? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, doctor? No, nothing... More to learn there, I'm afraid. I'll have him removed. Oh, and get some inquiries on the rear with the bicycle. Right. Uh, shall I send someone in? Who do you want to see first? I believe we'll start with Mrs. Douglas. You'll start with me. Gentlemen, Mr. Cecil Barker. Come in, Mr. Barker. Take a seat. Call for me if you want me. I've already given my statement to the police. I'm not the police. I'm well aware of who you are. But I'm saved the tedious necessity of introducing myself. Sit down, sir. <clears throat> My associate, Dr. Watson, Inspector MacDonald of Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard? Are you surprised that the Yard is involved, sir? Well, no, I suppose I'm not. Not really. This sort of international crime. What do you mean? I mean that Jack Douglas was hunted down by a killer from an American secret society. The same society that he was a member of years ago. The society that wanted him dead. You know this for a fact. <laughs> he never said as much. Not in so many words, but there were hints. And look at this place. Why else does a man buy a fortress unless he's in fear for his life? Well, I can think of several reasons. He raised the drawbridge every night. Respect for tradition. He checked every door and window. Natural caution. He never left this house without a revolver in his pocket. I tell you, I know what I'm talking about. You must have seen the brand mark on his arm and that card that was left. And a sawn-off shotgun, for God's sake, what more do you want? Fact. Hard fact, supported by evidence. Well, here's a fact. You can check it with the staff. The day before he was killed, Jack went into Tunbridge Wells. When he got back here, he looked dreadful, pale and shaking. I hadn't seen him like that for years, not since he left America. Ah, yes, yes, America. You're in business there, I understand. In California. We were partners in a gold mine. Why did you give it up? Jack just suddenly sold up and sailed for England. He wouldn't tell me why. But just a few days after he left, a man arrived asking for him. Not a Californian, a man from out east. Can you describe this man? Well built, tall, bearded. It was seven years ago. How long had you known Douglas before that? Five years. So, <clears throat> if your theory is correct, this society pursued its vendetta for at least 12 years and across two continents. My theory is correct. When did you follow Douglas to England? After 12 months, I got here just before he married. I was his best man. Did you know Mrs. Douglas before the wedding? I did not. But you've seen a good deal of her since. I've seen a good deal of him since. You can't visit a man without seeing his wife. Do you consider her a friend? Yes, I do. And did Mr. Douglas approve of your friendship with his wife? You've no right to ask such oh, questions. Oh, I've every right. 
What's your answer? I refuse to answer. None of this is relevant. There's a connection between the murder and the marriage. Why else did the killer take the wedding ring? How should I know that? Do you know how the murderer got away? Through the window and across the moat. How long after the shot did you get to the study? Not more than 30 seconds. I saw poor Jack's body and rang the bell for the servant straight away. But you saw no one? I've already said so. Then I heard Mrs. Douglas coming down the stairs. I rushed to stop her. Yes, and by that time the staff were there. I asked Mrs. Allen, the housekeeper, to take Ivy back up to her room. A task which she accomplished with ease. Hmm. No more questions. Easy, Councillor. You damn fool. I could have plugged you. What's wrong with giving the sign? There's no time for all that. Listen. Have you found out anything yet? We're doing everything possible, Mrs. Douglas. But have you made any progress? No. Spare no money. I want every effort to be made. Hmm. Perhaps you can tell us something that will help. I'm afraid not. How long had your husband been downstairs before you heard the shot? I can't say. Was he usually up that late? Yes, checking the doors and windows. Did he have a set routine for this check? I don't know. Well, perhaps he always started with the study. Perhaps. I really don't know. What happened after you heard the shot? Well, I'm sorry. I heard the shot. I heard the shot, and I put on my dressing gown and came down. Mr. Barker met me on the stairs. He met me on the stairs. He said, for God's sake, go back to your room. Poor Jack is dead. There's nothing you can do. For God's sake, go back. And then... And then he made Mrs. Allen, the housekeeper, take me back up. Did your husband ever speak about any danger threatening him from his past? Did he ever make any comment of that sort at all? The Valley of Fear. What did you say? The Valley of Fear. Three years ago, Jack was very ill, delirious with fever. One night, as I was bathing his forehead, he suddenly opened his eyes. He looked straight at me. But I don't think it was me he was seeing. And that was what he said. So low I could hardly hear. Am I never going to get out of the valley of fear? I saw him on the cars when I went down the line yesterday. He didn't know me. What names are you using? Steve Wilson, same as before. <laughs> He's not as clever as he thinks he is. Did you speak to him, Mr. Don't Hero? Don't you ever give it a rest, Baldwin? No, I didn't speak to him. I waited till he spoke to me. I'm writing an article for a paper in New York, says he. And I'm after anything you can tell me about the outrages. No. I've got his money. <laughs> hey, what did you do for it? I'm tired of your interruptions, Baldwin. Let Brother McMurdo tell this his own way. Body master. I fed him some nonsense. Stuff I knew he wanted to hear. And I promised him a lot more besides if he'd meet me at my lodgings nine o'clock tonight. <laughs> I fancy Mr. Birdie Edwards will find more of a welcome than he's expecting. <laughs> Good work, brother. There'll be a vacancy at Pinkerton's come the morning. <laughs> Hmm. Ah. What did you learn from the staff? Ah, nothing really new. Their master had no enemies that they knew of. He was a popular man in the village. Ames the butler confirms that Douglas was nervous and jittery when he came back from Tunbridge Wells. And Mrs. Allen's story matches Barker's exactly. He asked her to take Ivy Douglas back up to her room and sit with her. Have they telling the truth? Yes, I think they are. They've both been in service here since Douglas bought the house. And they're both genuinely shaken by his death, I'd swear to it. Hmm. Did they hear the shot? No, but the staff quarters are at the back of the house and the walls are pretty thick. Oh. Barker said he rang the bell. Yes, and they confirm it. They were there inside a minute. What's their opinion of Barker? 
An easy, free-going gentleman, but my word, I'd rather not be the man who crossed him. That's the butler. And the housekeeper. Rather too friendly with the master's wife, sir, if you want my opinion. Interesting. Hmm. Did you two make any progress while I was away? Ah, uh, I discovered that the moat's only about four feet deep at the edges, rather more than that in the middle. Yeah, is that relevant? Not my question exactly, Doctor. Mm, perhaps. Perhaps. Mm. Well, I'm away off for a spell. I want to see how White Mason's doing with that bicycle. Oh, yeah. uh, will you gentlemen come with me? Uh, no, I, I believe we'll stay here and uh, think things over. Ah, very good. I'll see you later, Mr. Yeah. Mac. Right. Impressions. Her first. She's a very beautiful woman. I but knew I could rely on you to observe that. Well, you can give me credit for a little more. Uh, go on. I was going to say, a very beautiful woman. But the look she gave us as she left was rather ugly. I could have sworn she was trying to read what impression she'd made on us. Anything else? The way she told us the events. Like a prepared speech. Mm. <laughs> None too well remembered. Yes. But I just don't believe she's that cold-blooded. She must have known we'd ask about the murder. Perhaps she did rehearse it before. I'm perfectly understandable. Mm. What about Barker? I couldn't decide if all that indignation was real or fake. What about this American business, the, uh, the threatening stranger, the secret society, the, the valley of fear? Oh, I believe you're about that. But it doesn't exactly fit in with your criminal mastermind theory, does it? Your professor, uh, what was it? Moriarty. Moriarty. That brand mark on Douglas's arm was real enough. It's a lie, Watson. A great, big, thumping, obtrusive, uncompromising lie. It met us on the threshold and it's been with us ever since. <laughs> now, come on. Now, uh, Barker's whole story is false. None of it adds up. But his story matches hers. Yeah. Therefore, she's lying, too. Uh, but why? Are you sure about this? What are they hiding? Why are the stories false? Because none of it's possible. Servants aren't lying. Well, maybe not, but they weren't there at the crucial time. They were there immediately afterwards. Mm, were they? Well, yes, or as near as damn it. <sighs> is all the American stuff false, too? What if Barker is shielding the woman? You think she's the killer? <laughs> what did you hear? The two of them. There. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of heartless creature can laugh like that just a few hours after her husband's murder? She doesn't shine as a wife, even in her own account. What do you mean? I'm not an admirer of womankind, as you know. Yes, I certainly do. But if, if I ever married... I'd hope that my wife would display rather more feeling for me than that, to allow herself to be meekly led away by a housekeeper when my corpse was lying within a few yards of her. <laughs> you really think she might have shot him? Or the two of them acting together? There's an appalling directness about your question sometimes. It's usually the only way I can get a direct answer. Touché. Well, am I going to get one now? There are three things I'd like you to do. <sighs> Go on. Organise us a room at the village inn and leave word at the police station that Mac and White Mason can find us there this evening and bring us up today. That's two things. What's the third? Lend me your umbrella. The house where McMurdo lived was well suited for what the Scourers had planned. It stood on the fringe of the town and well back from the road, and there were only two boarders, both of them brothers of the lodge. In any other case, the conspirators would simply have ambushed their man and emptied their pistols into him as they had many a time before. But this instance was different. We have to find out how much he knows already. And how much he's passed back to his employers. Maybe we're already too late. If we are... At least we'll have our revenge. No, no, no. We're not too late. If he knew anything big already, why did he pay me for the nonsense I fed him? And why did he agree to come here tonight? And when he comes, I'll take him into the hall, make sure he's alone. Then I'll bring him in here. 
and we'll show him the hospitality of the lodge. What's the time? Half an hour to go. Mmm. This is very good. Why don't you have some? Mmm. Very good. Can you entertain yourself tonight? I beg your pardon? I may just spend an hour or so alone in Douglas's study. Do Mrs. Douglas and Barker know? No, I arranged it all with Ames the butler after you'd left. I, mm. I think it's going to be very valuable. Soak up the atmosphere, that sort of thing. Soak up the atmosphere. With the aid of your umbrella, yes. Holmes, if you're expecting danger, that's a wretched sort of weapon. Oh, I'm not. I'm not. If it was danger threatening, I'd take you with me. Mr. Holmes! Doctor! Gentlemen! Oh, you two look as though you've had a good afternoon. Aye, we did that, Doctor. We've had the bicycle identified. Oh, congratulations. We took the machine over to Tunbridge Wells and showed it round the hotels. Mm -hmm. The manager of the Eagle Commercial knew it at once. It belonged to a man named Hargreave, who checked in two days before and then disappeared. Ah. The man was about 50 and tallish. Mm, that's a little vague, Mr. Mac. Why, well, it wasn't the sort to draw attention, Doctor. The manager did better with his clothes. A heavy grey suit with a reefer jacket... And a yellow overcoat. Ah, but this is the real snorter. The man was definitely an American. Prime up that stove, Willoughby. You cold, McMurdo. We'll strap him across it till he squeals. <laughs> How much longer? Fifteen minutes. Leicester. Leicester. Nottingham. Nottingham. Southampton. Southampton. East Ham. East Ham. East Ham. And Derby and Richmond and twelve other... Uh, Fourteen. Uh, Fourteen other places. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Is this the missing American? Aye, Doctor. Telegrams in response to our appeal. The country seems to be full of fugitives in yellow overcoats. Dear me. Well, Mr. Mack and Mr. White Mason, I have a piece of very earnest advice for you. Oh, man, I'll be pleased to hear it. Abandon the case. Holmes? You think it's hopeless? Yes, I do. But this cyclist must be somewhere. Why shouldn't we be able to no, find him? I don't him? doubt he's somewhere. I'm sure you'll find him. But stop wasting your energies in Richmond and East Ham, gentlemen. But last night you were congratulating us. Uh, what's happened since then? Two things. I spent a couple of hours at Bilston Manor. And? And I've read this. You didn't tell me about this. Well, I'm glad it's not just us you keep in the dark, Mr. Holmes. What is that, Doctor? The ancient manor house of Bilston. A short history. Short? but exceedingly interesting and purchasable at the modest sum of one penny from the local tobacconist. Well, you're making fools of us. This has nothing to do with the murder. Isn't it? Breads of view, Mr. Mack, one of the essentials of our profession. Take it from someone older and more experienced. I don't dispute that you're both of those, Mr. Holmes, but you have a damned round-the-corner sort of way of getting to your point. Why on earth should we drop the case? For the simple reason, my dear sir, that you don't have the faintest idea of what it is that you're investigating. I spent a very enjoyable hour alone here last night, and before that, Ames the butler was a mine of helpful information. He gave me this. An old slipper? What of those stains? Blood, exactly. This is one of the slippers which were adorning the feet of Mr. Cecil Barker when he discovered the body. Oh, well, then, of course, it's covered in blood. The whole corner of the room's covered in blood, and worse. Look at this. Oh, we've seen it. The killer's footprint on the sill. Mm, and if I place the slipper over it... Good God! It's an exact match. But what the devil was Barker doing climbing out of the window? And now, this well-concealed, muddy footprint behind the curtain. That one doesn't match at all. Ah, I said it was a snorter. You did, and you went wrong. Most of the rest of my time here was spent in a renewed search for the missing dumbbell. 
footmess and dumbbell. Oh, sorry, didn't I mention that? Remiss of me. The entire case hinges on the missing dumbbell. Mr. Holmes. I one more piece of advice. Well, I hope it's a sight more practical than the last one. I recommend a nice, cheery country walk for both of you. Then lunch at some suitable hostelry. And this evening, tired but happy. Man, this is getting past the And this the evening, talk. I'd be obliged if you'd join me at the gates to this house before dusk. Without fail, Mr. Mack. Oh, that sounds more like sanity. Oh, it was all. Excellent advice. Oh, one thing before we part. Well? I want you to write a note to Mr. Barker. Saying what? Here. I've drafted it for you. Well? Uh, that's not possible, Mr. Holmes. I've already inquired. Nonetheless. Give me that. Well, Inspector, what does it say? It says, Doctor, that at first light tomorrow, a gang of police workmen are going to set to to divert the river that runs through this estate. Divert the river? Yes. We're going to drain the moat. <sighs> He's not coming. It's not nine yet, Baldwin. Ah, you bungled it. He was wise to you. Quiet. And we're sitting here like rats in a trap. If you can't shut your mouth, Baldwin, I'll shut it for you. He'll come. My word on it. Watson? Yes. This gives us a good view of the study. Excellent. Well, we're here. What do we do now? We possess our souls and patience. Well, why are we here at all? We try to make as little noise as possible. <laughs> we have to set the scene to glorify our results sometimes. <laughs> this would be a drab and sordid sort of profession if we didn't. I'm a believer in direct action. Oh, Mr. Mack, the blunt accusation, the brutal tap on the shoulder. What could poor Watson here make of that? Hmm? But the subtle trap. The quick inference. The clever forecast. The anticipation, the thrill. Yeah. Yes, the thrill. Where would that be if I'd explained everything beforehand? Where's the pride and justification in that? All I ask is a little patience. Everything will become clear. Well, I hope the pride and the justification and the rest of it come before we all catch our death of cold. Oh, on the subject of the clever fog. No, I don't think I've forgotten. Forgotten what? Mr. Holmes has an informant in London who predicted this murder. Good God. Who is he? We don't know. He's just a name, Pollock. And it's the man behind him that matters. Oh, are you still sticking to that? Oh, yes, yes. Professor James Moriarty. The most dangerous criminal in England. You think he's behind this? Well, why wasn't I told? Oh, it's just Mr. Holmes's bee in a bonnet. I made some inquiries myself, you know. About Moriarty? Aye, Doctor. I went to see him. Did you indeed? And I'm bound to say that he struck me as a very respectable, learned and talented sort of man. Oh, I'm glad you've got so far as to recognise the talent. Oh, man, you can't help but recognise it. I had a chat with him about eclipses. Eclipses? Was that what you wanted to chat with him about? Well, no, it wasn't. To be truthful with you, how the talk got that way, I can't think. Yeah. But somehow it did. And I'll tell you. He had out a, a reflector, lantern, and a globe, and, and he made it all seem clear to me in a minute. Eclipses. Something dark and sealing something light. Moriarty's mirror image and explained with a reflector lantern. <laughs> he was playing with you. Now, he lent me a book on the subject, too, but I don't mind saying it was a bit over my head. But his whole manner, it struck me he'd have made a grand minister of the Kirk. Dear God. I'm telling you, Mr. Holmes, when he put his hand on my shoulder as we were parting, it was like a father's blessing before you go out into the cold, cruel world. <laughs> the man's a genius. Mr. Mac, James Moriarty sits at the centre of a web that stretches across the entire criminal world. But you have no proof, man. He draws checks on six different banks. He owns priceless works of art, and he pays his chief of staff £6,000 a year. Six... That's more than the Prime Minister gets. The professor's official salary is 700 per annum. But how can this professor be connected with this affair? Look, what is it? It's what we've been waiting for. There's a light in the study. Someone's moving about. Can you see who it is? No. no, no wait. I still can't see. Is that a gun? No. A grappling hook. 
confession, is it? There. What is it? Now, come on! Good evening, Mr. Cecil Barker. What the devil's the meaning of this? What do you all want? That's what we want, that bundle you just fished up from the bottom of the moat. How in thunder do you know about that? I know about it because I put it there. You must have... Perhaps I should say replaced it there. I fished it up myself last night with the aid of Dr. Watson's excellent umbrella. How did you know it was there in the first place? The missing dumbbell. Very good, Watson. The missing dumbbell. The crucial clue. You'll find it weighing down this interesting catch. There. One pair of boots, American, you'll know. One grey tweed suit with a reefer jacket. And one yellow overcoat. What did I tell you? He's not coming. Mr. Barker. I seem to be standing in the way of your explanation. If you know so much, Mr. Holmes, perhaps you'd better tell us some more. I could tell you a great deal more. But it would come with a better grace from you. Oh, you think so, do you? Yes, I do. And he's not the only one. Are you going to explain this or not? If there's a secret here, it's not mine to tell. Oh, that's your line, is it? Mr. Cecil Barker, I'm arresting you. You can do what you damn well like. No, Cecil. Ivy! Don't make it worse for yourself. You've done enough for us without that. Enough and more than enough. Oh. Mrs. Douglas, are you ill? It's this room. I'll be all right. Madam, I urge you to take the police completely into your confidence. Yes. Yes, I shall. But not here. Which is the correct room? Mr. Holmes? I knew we couldn't fool you. The dining room. Let's go into the dining room. You came then? Of course. You brought the money. Show me this proof. Come through. Well, where is he? Where's Bertie Edwards? He's here, Councillor. I am Bertie Edwards. Here. Thank you, Doctor. Now, will somebody please tell me what all this is about? Aye. Come along now, Mrs. Douglas. Tell us everything. Well... One moment. What is it now? Simply this. I think it might be best for all concerned if we were to ask someone else to tell the story. What? Don't you agree, Mr. Douglas? Good God. Gentlemen, my name is Jack Douglas. Are you seeing the move and the next bullet won't be for the ceiling? My men are all around this house. And you gentlemen are well and truly under arrest. I've heard of you. Sherlock Holmes. At your service. And you too, John H. Watson? Mr. Douglas. You're the historian of this bunch, isn't that right? Well, I'd lay my last dollar you've never had a story like mine pass through your hands before. There. I've spent the last few days in that rat trap putting it into words. You're welcome to it. You and your public. Move on there. And keep those hands where we can see them. Come on, move. Keep moving. You damned traitor, McMurdo. Well, I guess you can call me that if it eases your pain, Jack McGinty. I can call you more than that. I can call you murderer. Yeah. Captain, this man's responsible for the death of Chester Wilcox and his whole family. Now, is that so? 
Then how can it be that I saw Wilcox and his brood alive and well only this afternoon? What? I made sure they were all well away before I blew their house, McGinty. Just as I made sure a lot of other jobs went wrong. You were there when old Stanger got taught a lesson. That makes you an accomplice. I stopped Baldwin from kicking the man to death. That makes me something else. I'm thinking. Oh, hey. It makes you something special right now. Something very special. Why, you... Now, not one more word out of you, Baldwin. Brother! Or you, Councillor McGinty. If any one of you escapes the noose, you know what you have to do. I've said all I have to say. Get me away from this filthy traitor! Sergeant! All right, move! Move! Come on. You okay? My God, Andrew... I wouldn't go through those months again for ten times the money. You got those devils, and that's what counts. Yes, I got them. But I had to go to hell to do it. Come on, let's finish the job. Many extra men of the Cold and Iron Police had been brought in secret into the small township of Vermissa for that night's work. Lodge 341 was soon no more. In the early hours of the next morning, a beautiful woman and a young man, fresh-faced, large-eyed and smiling, could be seen at the small hut which served as Vermissa's railroad station. I knew it. I knew it. I knew you could never be like them. Oh, John... The special train sent by the railroad company made a swift, unbroken journey away from the land of coal, iron, clank and roar. It was the last time Etty Shafter and her lover ever set foot in the Valley of Fear. Ten days later, they were married, with old Jacob Shafter as witness of the wedding. The trial of the Scourers was held far away from any place where their adherents might have terrified the guardians of the law. The work of Bertie Edwards was complete. That's the past, Mr. Douglas. What he wants is your story of the present. No, wait. Just wait. Are you truly Jack Douglas of Burlston Manor? I am, sir. At least ways, I am now. Then whose death have we been investigating these last two days? And where the devil did you spring out Mr. from? Mr. Mack, he wouldn't read that excellent pamphlet. The history of the house. Of course. Yes, it really is very informative. The architecture, the design, the gardens, the various owners, the concealment of King Charles during the Civil War. Apparently, your people didn't hide in those days without reliable places to hide in. And the bolt hole that's been used once can be used again. How long have you been playing this trick on us, Mr. Holmes? Yes, how long have you let us waste our time and our efforts on a wild goose chase? Not for one instant. It was only last night that I knew for sure that the dead man wasn't Jack Douglas, but your elusive cyclist. And that Douglas was almost certainly still in the house, waiting for quieter times and his chance to slip away. Well, you figured it out right. So is this still a murder investigation or isn't it? Mr. Douglas? I don't know how I stand under your law, but I'll tell you this. There's been nothing in this business I wouldn't do again. And I think the same goes for Ivy and Cecil there. We've done nothing we're ashamed of. Nothing. It all comes down to this. There are men who have good cause to hate me. They hunted me from Chicago to California and they chased me out of America. But when I moved here and settled down with a new name and a new life, I thought they'd never find me. Well, I was wrong. You saw one of these men when you went into Tunbridge Wells. The worst of them all. But I know my business, Mr. Holmes. 
I made sure he didn't see me. You came back here and waited for him to track you down. I did. It happened a damn sight sooner than I was expecting. Still careless, Baldwin. Still careless. You see... I'd seen his boots under the curtain as soon as I came into the room. I don't know if it was him or me pulled the trigger. Maybe it was both of us together. Anyway, he got both barrels full in the face. He may have escaped the noose 20 years ago, but justice had caught up with him at last. Were you the first on the scene, Mr. Barker? I was. That much was true, at least. Good God in heaven! John, what's happening? Ivy, don't come in! You did see the body. No wonder you couldn't bear to be in the room just now. Yes, I saw it. I don't think I'm ever going to get that sight out of my head. Come on, my love. Sit down now. Oh, Jack, for God's sake, what's happening? I'll tell you everything, I swear. I should have done it years ago, but not now. Are you going to be all right up here on your own? That man, who was he? My God, who shot him? Was it you, Jack? Was it you? Ivy, listen, I... I've got to go and sort this out. We must send for the police. No, not yet. Why not? Jack, I want to know what this all means. You shall, but not now. Yes, now. Tell me now. I'll tell you this much. It's over. At last, it's over. I'd already had the idea. Yeah, I seemed to see it all clear at a glance. His height and weight were much the same as mine. No one could swear to his face, poor devil. And, of course, he had the mark. The brand of the Scourers. You exchanged clothes and therefore identities. All except for my wedding ring. It would have taken a file to get it off. I was glad. That ring's all I've got left of my first wife. She died of the typhoid just a few years after we married. I'd not have given it to Ted Baldwin, even if it cost me the whole game. You changed clothes and went and hid in the priest hole and left your accomplice to do the rest. It was simple enough. The footprint, the card, the shotgun. The dead man's clothes, you bundled them up. And got rid of them in the quickest, easiest place you could think of. The moat. Man, if you hadn't used the dumbbell, we might never have been on to you. And then, with everybody else safely out of the way, you rang for the servants. But what about the housekeeper's evidence? Perfectly genuine. Mrs. Douglas? Cecil, Mr. Barker, gave me a signal and I came down the stairs again. I had to pretend that I'd just heard the shot. Which you did well enough. It was your willingness to be led away from your husband's body that was less convincing. So the murder, the shooting, actually happened quite a bit earlier than the servants thought. Half an hour or so. It's not easy undressing a dead man. Well, that's it. It seemed to me that all I had to do was lie low for a while, then I could get away someplace. Ivy could come out and be with me, and we could finally live at peace. A new life in a new land. That's the truth. The whole truth, so help me God. Now, what are you going to do with me? Writing it up. Hmm. Getting my notes in order. Hmm. You're not using Douglas's own words. 
more or less. But I gave him his manuscript back. Oh. I thought he ought to have it. It's an historic sort of document. Oh, well, I suppose so. Ah, certainly a splendid story. And with the right ending, too. Killing in self-defence. And just a mild warning about trying to deceive the police. <sighs> Very satisfactory. Hmm. Hmm. Anything interesting in the post? What? Ah, that's how this whole business started, isn't it? Holmes? What's wrong? They were on the Palmyra, bound for South Africa. A new life in a new land. And? Look at this. My God. Lost overboard in a calm sea. No one knows how the accident occurred. No. Accident? Are you saying the Scourers did no, it? Not the Scourers, Moriarty. Moriarty? Oh, I'm sorry. I just don't see how he can be connected to all this. The Scourers needed someone to track down Douglas for them. And this Moriarty can be uh, uh, hired? Yes, he's, he's a consultant. His services can be bought just like any other consultants. <sighs> but even if you're right, the Scourers had their own assassin. Moriarty wasn't employed to kill Douglas. Well, maybe not, but his power rests on his reputation. He can't afford to be linked to a failure. Besides, he's a mathematician. Mathematics is a precise science. Moriarty can't tolerate untidiness. Dear God. And so he murdered him. With my help. What? I killed Jack Douglas as surely as if I pushed him myself. Oh, that is utter nonsense. His plan was a good one. Mason and McDonald would have accepted things at face value. Douglas's death would have been reported and that would have been an end to it. If I hadn't insisted on, on solving the case, I'll, I'll triumph a Sherlock Holmes. Rubbish! If this Moriarty is as good as you say he is, he wouldn't have relied on newspaper reports. He'd have found out the truth for himself, even if you'd done nothing. The outcome would have been exactly the same. I should have protected him, made him understand the danger. Good God, Holmes. You're not some kind of infallible machine. You mustn't do this to yourself. You mustn't. Besides, you can't be sure, can you? Not absolutely sure. It may truly have been an accident. The report's just come in, sir. A good, clean job. No complications. Ah. Nothing out of the ordinary in the luggage, except this. Mm. Some sort of manuscript. The Colonel thought you'd like to see it. Hmm. Thank you. My life in the Valley of Fear. Hmm. I shall read it with pleasure. You may go. Good night, Professor. Good night. Hmm. It was the 4th of February in the year 1875 and the snow lay deep in the gorges of the Gilmerton Mountains. This is the most desolate corner of the United States of America. No, it was him. I can tell a Moriarty when I see one. 
<sighs> and do we just have to sit down under this? Can no one get level with this man? No, I, I don't say that. I don't say that he can't be beaten. But you must give me time. You must give me time. Episode 2 of The Valley of Fear by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams. John McMurdo, Ian Glenn. Inspector MacDonald, Mark Bonner. White Mason, Timothy Bateson. Ivy Douglas, Becky Hindley. Cecil Barker, Gavin Muir. Etty Shafter, Amanda Gordon. Jack McGinty, Constantine Gregory. Ted Baldwin, Stephen Critchlow. Mike Scanlon, Peter Gunn, Captain Marvin, Jonathan Keeble. Ronald Pickup was Professor Moriarty. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The pianist was Michael Haslam. The violinist, Abigail Young. The Valley of Fear was dramatised for radio by Bert Cools and directed by Enid Williams. <laughs>